I'm Celeste, and this is 10 Minutes of History from the Balboa Island Museum. Today we're going to talk about James Irvine, the first. James was born in Belfast, Ireland in 1827. He was the eighth of nine children, and they were very poor. So in the, during the potato famine, he and his younger brother William came to New York City in 1846 to work in a paper mill. Just like all the other boys in New York City in 1849, he heard about the gold rush and they decided to come over to California and see if they could make a fortune. So they got on a ship, went down to Panama, crossed the isthmus, and on the other side they got on a ship called the Humboldt, which Irvine describes as a wretched excuse for a vessel. And I don't know why, but it took 101 days to get from the Isthmus of Panama up to San Francisco, which is not the normal time it takes. So something obviously happened along the way. A fortunate thing that happened along the way was that he met two people that would change his life. One was Benjamin Flint Sr. and the other was Collis Huntington of the Big Four Railroad Men. And we'll get to that later. So, he goes up to San Francisco. He takes uh, his turn at mining, which he's not all that great at, but he does get into business with John Lyons, who is in the produce and wholesale grocery business. He has a shop on Front Street, San Francisco, which is going to be a place where all the miners get off the ships and want to buy their supplies. And so they make a good deal of money doing that. Irvine makes enough money that he starts buying real estate in San Francisco. Now he gets into business with Benjamin Flint's nephews, Benjamin and Thomas Flint, and their cousin, um, Lewin Bixby. They uh, start a business called um, Flint Bixby and Company. That's Irvine, he's the company. And along with Colonel Hollister, they drive 2,000 head of sheep over to Monterey to a rancho that they have purchased there. Now, the, the Flints and Bixby are from Maine. They're good Maine stock, and they're used to a good amount of work, and they end up being very good partners for Irvine. As we get into the mid-60s, in 1864 and 65, we have the biggest drought, and the worst drought that we've ever had in California, and almost all the cattle in the state die. This is going to be the end of the ranchos in California. What happens is in 1850 we become a state and the ranchos now need to pay taxes, which is fine because they have mm, mm, herds of huge cattle and that's their whole money maker. But they come up to this time in the 60s with the drought and now they don't have any income so they have to start borrowing money. And so all of the ranchos get into big trouble. Off of our island here, we had two very large ranchos. One was the Rancho Santa Ana, owned by the Yorba and Peralta families, and the other was Rancho San Joaquin, owned by Jose Andre Sepulveda. Behind Rancho San Joaquin was the um, Rancho Lomas de Santiago, which was owned by a nephew of Yorba. So we had these three big ranchos that came, went from our coast right here all the way up to the mountains. When the Yorba Rancho got into trouble, one of their main problems was that they had too many heirs. And so they had all of these people that they had to figure out who was going to get what. And so they had to bring the courts in to do that. So everyone had a percentage. The, the Flint Bixby Company had purchased a piece of a, a percentage of that land from uh, William Wolfskill. And so when it came to the courts, um, the courts then figured out and gave the pieces out to the different owners and the uh, Flint Bixby Company ended up with three quarters of a mile, it's just a stretch, eight mile stretch, three quarters of a mile that led right up to the San Ana River. Then Sepulveda needed to sell. And so, because um, the Flint's, Bixby, and Irvine had made all this money in the sheep business, they had enough money to buy the um, Rancho Santiago straight up. And so they just bought that whole thing. And William Wolfskill had purchased for $7,000 the, 
the Rancho Lomas de Santiago, and um, he sold it for $7,000, so he didn't make anything on that. So here's what we end up owning that Irvine, um, the Plunt Index, we end up owning this that I've dotted here. So we have the Rancho San Joaquin, Rancho um, Lomas de Santiago, and then this little strip of the Rancho Santa Ana comes to a total of 110,000 acres. And so they end up with over 100,000 sheep on there. Uh, in this um, time, backing up a little bit, James Irvine sells his um, part of the wholesale grocery business, the one on Front Street that he had with John Lyons. John Lyons has already left the business and Irvine sells the rest of it to his brother William. So he's up there running that business. In 1866, James Irvine goes to Cleveland. Now he has an attachment to Cleveland now because his parents have ended up in Cleveland. They've come over from Belfast to Cleveland. He has, still has plenty of, of his um, brothers and sisters that are back in Ireland. And because Irvine's making so much money, he's sending money, and this is all documented how much he sends and everything. Um, and I have it in this lovely book here by Cleveland that um, he's sending them money all the time to support his family, which was, you know, that's just so, such a nice thing to know about him. So he goes to Cleveland and there he marries Nettie Rice. Now Nettie Rice is the daughter of Harvey Rice. And if you haven't read this book, this is a great book called The Pioneers and it's about the settling of Ohio after the Revolutionary War and, um, you know, into this rugged, rugged country. And the two things that, that the founders of Ohio wanted um, were to settle that area um, and the, one of their very major priorities was education. And so um, Harvey Rice has a statue of himself in Cleveland and because they actually consider him the founder of the common school, the, it was going to be education for all. And so he's pretty famous. So she came from a, a very famous family. They, um, the Irvines lived in San Francisco and of course they had their own children up there and they educated their children up there. Um, let's see, they um, ended up in business, the Flint's Bixby and Irvine, for about 12 years. And after that 12 years, Irvine bought out the Flint's and Bixby and so he owned the whole of that property outright. He continued to farm sheep. In fact, he really didn't want to grow crops on that land. There was um, times where he, the, the manager and the other people that were on the property suggested to him that they would like to have um, to grow crops so to, to support themselves and to, and he wasn't really keen on the idea, but he did say, okay, you know, you can do a small portion, but I don't really want to have anything to do with this and I don't want any financial um, part of this either. So for about a hundred years, Irvine and his heirs successfully raise sheep on that property. And then they bring in cattle and cattle, the cattle business pretty much takes over the sheep business. And the last sheep leave the ranch in 1959. And then of course, by then they have become um, a, a, a large farming um, ranch as well. So, I'm gonna take you back a little bit to that experience on the Humboldt and tell you about his experience with Collis Huntington. So Collis Huntington, like I said, is one of the big four of the railroads and specifically the Southern Pacific Railroad. Um, supposedly on that 101 day trip, Collis Huntington and James Irvine had a poker game that went bad. And because of it, they hated each other for the rest of their lives. And because of that, James Irvine hated the Southern Pacific Railroad and he never wanted an association with it, which was very important when he ends up hooking up with James McFadden after Dunnells has, has um, discovered the, the port business because that's why they wanted to really um, have an association with the Santa Fe and not the Southern Pacific Railroad. So he pretty much carries that grudge and passes that grudge on to McFadden for the rest of his life. and carries it into his heirs as well. So it was very interesting that that happened on that boat and, and you know, you just never know what's going to happen. Collis Huntington's um, nephew, Henry Huntington, is the one that brought the red line to Newport and that's a whole other subject which we'll talk about at another time.
time. So I think that's about 10 minutes of history, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.